welcome to this year's Owen of the Year Award Ceremony. Over the past 16 years, we have honoured Old Millfieldian authors, international sportsmen and Olympic champions, media personalities, West End and film directors, gardeners, chefs, musicians, national and industrial leaders, politicians, entrepreneurs, pioneering doctors, and charity and humanitarian workers, both in this country and abroad. The list is long and impressive, and it's especially impressive because of the enormously wide breadth of achievement. Today's five Old Millfieldians illustrate beautifully this point, five vastly different fields of achievement. In simplistic terms, we've a film producer, an auctioneer, a sportsman, a doctor, and a dance choreographer. And we'll start alphabetically, as always, with our film producer, Jenny, Jenny Barraclough. We might well consider Jenny for the title of Millfield's first young lady all-rounder. Mary Bignall, our triple Olympian, joined her at Millfield for just a term in 1955, but Mary was an athlete and not an Oxford scholar, as was Jenny, Jenny Izzard, as she was in those days. Our 1955 magazine reports tell us that Jenny played in the school's annual hockey match against Oxford University. I hope you remember all these uh, things, Jenny. She represented the school at badminton and also played in the inaugural mixed tennis match against Beedales. She left Millfield in 1956, having been awarded an exhibition at St Hilda's Oxford. And in her first year there, our magazine reports that she'd enjoyed the year, been involved with dramatic productions, and had been to a great many parties. <laughs> she wound up with the BA Honours in English. Jenny then became a TV reporter for ITV News, then a researcher, director, producer, and director, and she's achieved considerably more since receiving an OBE in 2009. It really is worth looking up Jenny Barraclough in Wikipedia because she has six pages. Jenny was a significant presence in television for over 40 years. She was one of the first women TV producers and made many award-winning television documentaries that were landmark programs. For example, her film, Gale is Dead, was one of the first to draw attention to young homeless and drug addicts. Her film, Women in Prison, was the first film to be shot in a woman's prison in the United Kingdom, and for that, she won a BAFTA award. She was head of BBC One Documentaries and chose to make films whose impact upon their audience was to increase understanding of important issues. She won very many international awards for these documentaries, including an Emmy. In 2001, she filmed The New Face of Leprosy, which was shown to 27 million people on BBC World. She saw the wonderful work that Lepra did, Lepra, the Leprosy Relief Association, and she later became a member of this executive board of the charity, helping to make decisions on the treatment of leprosy, TB and AIDS among thousands of people, primarily in India. She is now the chair of Lepra, involved in managing a charity with a £7 million annual income and employing over 4,500 people worldwide. Lepra teams save thousands of lives. I really don't think that there's any doubt at all that Jenny, Jenny Barraclough, thoroughly deserves her Old Millfieldian of the Year Award. Goodness, it's quite something coming back when it's looking so magnificent, this school now. When I was here, we were in Nissen Huts. This was 1955, 56, 54, 55 maybe. There was an ark of Nissen Huts, all bought a surplus army, you know, very cheap. And I know what got me where I am today, as it were. I know what it was. It was sitting there in the freezing cold 
with one little oil stove in the Nissen hut with wonderful Robert Bolt. He was part of my life, but Robert Bolt was my daily tutor, and it was only me and him because I wanted to get into Oxford, and he was teaching English, and he was the only person doing it, and I was the only person reading for Oxford that year. I had this beautiful man with this beautiful mind all to myself. I mean, imagine that. He was writing Man for All Seasons, and he used to come down in the mornings when we were, you know, the, the first lesson, trying out scenes on me and saying, what do you think of this, what do you think of that? We were reading Moore's Utopia, which was absolutely brilliant. And life was wonderful. And I know, absolutely know, that's why I got into Oxford, because of him. And of course, there was the example of Boss, who had this lovely attitude that everybody has potential. He enabled children of all ages, stages, and wealth. There were people far poorer than we were, who, as you know, had scholarships, some were very good at games. So it was a very egalitarian school. And you'd find yourself mixing with, one of my good friends was a rugby player from Wales, whose father was a minor, uh, who arrived with very little education. And um, one of my friends was the Sultan's son, I, I, who, um, who had his own valet living in street. Uh, there were all shapes and sizes of people. It doesn't matter where they come from, they can be as rich or as poor as you like, they've all got something, they can all get somewhere. And I think I kept that with me all my life, in a way. And, and, and when I was making documentary films, which is what I've spent my life doing, I really tried to see what was in even the least likely person. Anyway, we move on now to uh, Guy Bennett. Guy is our auctioneer, but of course he really is much more than that. He was head of St Anne's and also was awarded the school's top award for outstanding service, so his reports were probably very good. He got his BA at the University of California, Berkeley, and did his postgraduate studies at Hartford College, Oxford University, both in the history of art. Thus, it was clear that Guy was destined for the art world, and what a success he made of that. In 1997, Guy joined Christie's 20th Century Art Department. He rose swiftly through the ranks, joining the Impressionist and Modern Art Department in 2001. In 2004, he was appointed head of the Impressionist and Modern Art Evening Sales. And in 2006, he became international head of the department and the senior vice president of Christie's. Under Guy's direction, the November 2006 Impressionist and Modern Art Evening Sales broke all records to become the highest grossing sale in auction history reaching 500 million US dollars. In 2007, Guy produced the second most valuable sale ever, totaling 396 million dollars. But then he left Christie's and after leaving, he has become chief of acquisitions and collections for the Qatar Museums and also for the Al Thani family, the ruling family of Qatar. To date, there, Guy is responsible for an acquisition fund worth in excess of $12 billion, and the New York Times has referred to him as a master dealmaker. Donating his time as auctioneer, Guy has raised over £200 million for various charities, mostly in America. Within Britain, most of his charitable work has been focused on educational causes, working towards equality and opportunity for children from all backgrounds, personally pledging almost a million pounds. He has recently established the Ignota Foundation, which helps pupils from across Britain's state schools attend university, but in a unique and creative way that helps foster accountability. And you'll be pleased to know that Guy hasn't forgotten Millfield, for example, he has set up in perpetuity the Bennett Family Art Scholarship for financially underprivileged students. 
Furthermore, last year he made a major financial contribution towards establishing a new Millfield Business Centre which will help foster innovation among pupils and provide essential vocational skills. In addition, as a trustee, he has agreed to help our Millfield Foundation raise £100 million for people scholarships. Most recently, as auctioneer at the Millfield Gala, celebrating Millfield's 80th birthday, nearly a thousand, uh, I beg your pardon, a million, I'm not talking in thousands today, am I? It's, uh, it's all millions, uh, over a million pounds was raised. Guy has achieved, and he's still achieving, quite astonishing things. But I think that the key point is that, having done so much in his professional life, and still doing much in that life, he is now utterly dedicated to helping others who are underprivileged in one way or another. I think that says a great deal about this remarkable man, Guy Bennett, and his mother will now accept the award on Guy's behalf. Headmaster, governors, honorees, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, John, for these kind words. Before I read this, I must explain that until I arrived, I had no idea this existed. This is something that Guy has sent and has asked me to read it. It is truly an honour and means an enormous amount, not only to my parents and myself, but also to my children, who I hope will one day attend this great school. It also means a great deal to my wife, Rachel, who over the years has allowed me so actively to re-engage with the school. She has wholeheartedly embraced Millfield, and after her first visit to the campus, she loved it, despite it being freezing, cold and raining. I would also like to thank a gentleman who also helped to shape the success I have achieved. Many of you have heard about the Millfield mix, the importance of preserving that, and in doing so, preserving the future of the school. However, I would like to briefly touch on another phenomenon I like to call the Millfield moment, a moment that I believe all students at this school will experience at one point or another. Some may be lucky enough to recognise it as it happens, I myself didn't recognise it until years later. In 1988, Mr Neve, my house parent at St Anne's Boarding House, selected me to be head of house in my final year. To this day, I do not quite understand why he picked me, and in all honesty, I am somewhat fearful to ask him, for fear he may shatter whatever fantasy I've created in my head. However, in choosing me, he instilled discipline, confidence, responsibility, and a feeling of success, which I owned outright. Not beholden to anyone. That is my Millfield moment, and that is what changed my life. Millfield is a community that inspires, educates, cultivates, and nurtures each and every one of you, and the talent that exists within you. But what is more remarkable is that this Millfield community will continue to do these things long after you've left campus. Never forget, never forget this. Make every effort to stay in touch with your friends and teachers. Make every effort to visit the campus Make every effort to be part of the OM Society. Make every effort to attend the multitude of events that take place each year. Make every effort to be a true Millfieldian. But here's the rub. When doing all of these things, make every effort to try and recognise your Millfield moment. And when you do recognise it, and you do understand it, Please, I encourage each and every one of you, at some point in your life, to give back to this great community that has given you so much. And in doing so, help create someone else's Millfield moment. Thank you.
Mohammed El Shorbagi. We now come to our world champion sportsman. Just weeks ago, Mohammed won the British Open Squash Championships. He is ranked number one men's player, squash player in the world, and his brother Marwan, who was at Millfield with Mohammed, is ranked number nine. And I'm delighted that uh, Marwan is able to join you today, Mohammed, together with your mother. Both boys are from Egypt and both came to Millfield as excellent squash players. Mohammed's school reports reflect his enormous potential and achievements when he was at school. David Trevis, his group tutor, wrote, Mohammed is an extraordinarily determined and single-minded young man whose ability to achieve his goals mark him out as an exceptional student. And later, he would not have achieved what he has without being a particularly driven individual. The headmaster made a shrewd forecast in his report, Mohammed is an outstanding talent and he will achieve great things. A name we've not mentioned so far in this story is Jonah Barrington. Jonah, who was director of squash at Millfield for a great many years and coached both brothers during their time here. And who better in the world? Jonah won the British Open six times. On Mohammed's final school report, he wrote, Mohammed, like Julius Caesar, came, saw, and conquered. I have coached for what seems an eternity, and I have not seen such an unusual talent so close at hand. Anyway, after Millfield, Mohammed studied for his degree in business enterprise at the University of the West of England. He joined the PSA, the Professional Squash Association, in 2006, and in 2007, he became the youngest player in history to secure a maiden world tour title at a five-star event. He then made history again, becoming only the second man to win the World Squash Championships twice when he won the tournament in 2008 and 2009. He won the PSA Young Player of the Year Award in 2009 and 2010. He was the finalist at the 2012 World Championship. In 2013, he claimed his first World Series win in the Qatar Classic. Last year, he won five events, including World Series tournaments in the Hong Kong and United States Opens. The latter in particular was significant because it elevated Mohammed to world number one for the first time in his career. He lost a second world championship final against the fellow Egyptian during the 2014 tournament in what has been dubbed as one of the greatest squash matches ever. He recovered from his world championship disappointment to lift the tournament of champions title in January this year and just a couple of months ago, as mentioned, he lifted the British Open title for the first time in his career. And just 21 days ago, Mohammed won his second successive Qatar Classic with a 3-1 victory over his great rival, Gregory Gaultier, the same man that he beat in the British Open. Today, Mohammed is the current world number one and British Open squash champion and today, Mohammed is also one of our old Millfieldians of the year. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here in front of everyone. Uh, it's great to be back to Millfield again. And uh, I just remember uh, in 2006 when the World Championship was in Egypt, uh, I was 15 years old. Uh, I went to Joey Barrington, the son of Jonah. He was playing the World Championship there. And um, after he lost, I asked him if he wanted to go for a hit. He didn't even know me. He didn't even know who I was. And uh, I told him I was in a French school at the time and uh, living in Alexandria. And, uh, and he said, uh, would you be interested to come and study in Millfield? And then uh, I thought he was joking. I thought uh, he uh, was just uh, telling me anything to just uh, make me go away. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the day after, and then he took his, my, my number. And uh, then he called me the day after. And then he told me, are you serious about coming to Millfield? 
And then I just found myself saying yes. And then in one week, I found my life changed and I found myself studying here in Millfield. And uh, I remember my mother was the one who was pushing me to go and speak to the players who lost to uh, try and have a hit with them and get some experience from, the, from them. And uh, it uh, just, everything just happened like that, you know. And uh, I remember I was, I'm always close to my families. In Egypt, the culture, you're always close to the families. And uh, I've always been close to my mother. So uh, taking that crazy decision of just leaving me by myself as a 15 years old who couldn't even speak English and just living by myself here, it was just a crazy decision. And uh, I remember uh, my mother came with me here one week uh, for one week to see everything. And uh, just by the train, when she went, uh, before she went back to Egypt, when uh, I was just telling, saying goodbye to her at the train station, she was crying. And uh, she was, uh, I was just hugging her and just told her everything will be all right, don't worry. And, uh, but I didn't know if everything was going to be all right because it's the first experience I've had in my life where I was going to be alone. But luckily I had Jonah with me at the train station and then he looked at me and then he told me, don't worry, everything will actually be all right. <laughs> and then uh, I stayed here for three years and in those three years, I won two World Junior Championship. Uh, I got to the top 20 in the professional scene as a 17 years old and uh, my English got a little bit better. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, and um, just my life was completely changed. And then luckily my brother came to me the year after and uh, my mother was able to come with us and then uh, it was, it's home here, you know. Uh, every time I come back here, I feel home. Uh, my advice to people who are joining Millfield is to, uh, uh, to make sure that uh, you enjoy every single day here because uh, uh, one day you won't be able to take those days back. And uh, I felt that today when I came back here, I remembered everything uh, uh, the moment I arrived here and uh, it's, uh, there are things, some things you wish you, you take back and you can't, and uh, Millfield, uh, the three years I spent in Millfield for sure was, uh, is uh, one of them. <laughs> Sarah Jarvis is uh, not a world-class sportswoman. <coughs> Indeed, Colin Atkinson, her headmaster in writing her reference for Cambridge said, she was, by universal agreement, a strikingly independent, determined and hard-working girl Academically, she was first class. She was not a talented games player, but kept very fit, nevertheless, enjoying swimming and more individualistic forms of exercise. She also enjoyed drama and music. Uh, actually, the headmaster was uh, rather hard on Sarah because at uh, Edgerly, at uh, MPS, she was the school under 12 swimming champion. You remember that, I, I'm sure. Uh, she also won the Drama Cup there for her performance as Mrs. Malaprop in Sheridan's The Rivals. At Millfield, a house parent wrote, as deputy head of house, Sarah has been totally reliable and conscientious. Despite a full work schedule, she has devoted a considerable amount of time to helping other members of the house with their work. Sarah went on to attend both Cambridge, where she was awarded an exhibition at the age of 16, and Oxford Universities studying medicine, and she then qualified as a GP. Her interests in patient self-help awareness, her communication skills and almost boundless energy have made her one of the best-known advisory <coughs> doctors on television and radio. But she also finds time for charity work and to lecture around the world. She's been a GP partner in the same busy inner city London practice for over 21 years. She has also been a GP trainer for the last 17 years and is a medical writer and broadcaster. She was the ITN lunchtime news doctor for 10 years doctor to BBC Two's Jeremy Vine show for the last eight years, doctor to the One show, BBC One, for the last five years, to Good Housekeeping and My Weekly magazines. She also appears on BBC Breakfast, Daybreak on ITV, Sky News and Radio 5 Live. In 2011, she became a clinical consultant to patient co.uk where she writes a regular blog. She's also the author of six books. Sarah seems to be one of those people who manages to fit into their day, their life 
much more than would seem possible. I am absolutely thrilled and honoured to be invited back. And I thought, what are my abiding memories of Millfield? And I will be entirely honest, number one is being short. <laughs> because when I arrived, Millfield is not the sort of place that pigeonholes you. I arrived aged eight. Uh, my parents, my father, who's in the audience, I'm delighted to say, my parents were working abroad. And Millfield had decided that they wouldn't put me in the year with children my own age. They'd put me in the year they thought I was academically suited to, which happened to be um, in the year of children who were two and three years older than me. Now, as you can see, I'm not vertically gifted. <laughs> and when you are two years younger than everybody else and you're already short to start with, you kind of stand out. And I was really worried about that at the time. But actually, when I look back, it gave me the most extraordinary experience. And I think it really says everything there is to say about Millfield, because Millfield really is the ultimate example of treating you like an individual. There are so many memories of Millfield, but I think probably playing Polly Garter in the school production of Under Milk Wood was a defining moment, I think. And little did I realise at the time quite how much use I would have for my theatrical skills in my later medical life. I had some amazing grounding when I was at Millfield and interestingly I had grounding in all sorts of things that I didn't realise would interest me because John was absolutely right. I did arrive at Millfield. Indeed I arrived at Edgerley at the age of eight knowing that I wanted to be a GP. I didn't want to be a doctor, I wanted to be a GP. And when I went for my scholarship interview at Cambridge, I got the only bit of career advice that I ever got from Millfield. But bless them, they hadn't really needed to give me any career advice because I already knew what I wanted. But I was called out of a lesson the day before my interview and called in to see the careers teacher who sat me down and said, well, you know what you want to do and you're going off for this interview. And actually, I don't think there's any doubt you'll get what you'll want. You're that sort of person. But I would give you two bits of advice. Firstly be yourself, but secondly, for God's sake, don't tell them you want to be a GP. <laughs> and you know what? Millfield, once again, was right. They gave me extraordinary experiences all the way along the line, and it wasn't just to me, it was to my brother as well. Well, finally, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Andrew Wright. Andrew was born and lived just a few hundred yards from where he's sitting at the moment. Uh, and in fact, he's, uh, he was near enough to dance to school every day. His reports are interesting as they indicate the direction that Andrew has taken since he left Millfield 24 years ago. Rod Speed was his uh, head of year, and uh, he said, Andrew is a wholehearted fellow, not for him the quiet life. Joe Farthing, his drama teacher, remarked that Andrew's talent as a performer was magnificently demonstrated in the school's production of Kiss Me Kate. He is a lively and talented pupil. Brian Gaskell, good to see you here, Brian, former headmaster, wrote, Andrew is a very keen and conscientious worker. He gets a very good chit as an honest, straightforward boy, responsible and pleasant. He is an excellent actor with a very good voice. And his dance teacher added, his ideas are creative, he shows determination and imagination, and of course dance has dominated his life ever since. On leaving Millfield, Andrew trained with the National Youth Music Theatre and the Arts Educational Schools. And before becoming a choreographer, he performed for 13 years in shows such as Mary Poppins, Cats, Follies, Anything Goes, Mac and Mabel, and Beauty and the Beast. But now, of course, he is a full-time choreographer in his own right. His career has encompassed a wide range of productions from West End musicals to arena events, working with 400 strong choirs to intimate cabarets of one person. Andrew has been nominated for and won some of the top choreographer awards in the business in this country and abroad. For example, Singing in the Rain, a popular musical, went to the West End in 2012 and ran for many years. It's toured Asia and Australia. It's had rave reviews, and I want to quote from some. 
The Daily Telegraph said, its secret weapon is the choreographer Andrew Wright, who fills the stage with dancing of superb vitality and style. It's this kind of graceful, eloquent transition that makes great musicals so magical. Andrew has been involved at the highest level in dozens of shows. However, I'll leave you with his latest, Guys and Dolls, one of the most popular musicals ever. This will be in the West End next month as part of a UK tour opening at the Savoy Theatre. I'm going to be honest, the, um, the 80s and 90s was not the easiest time for a, 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 a young boy to dance. It was aimed at girls and a, you know, it was a tough career choice. It was fate, I think, that the year I came here, the dance studio opened, and it's wonderful that I walked past today and I think it's still there, I think it's still in operation. And this amazing teacher, who I sadly don't think is here, is called Miss Robinson, who was a dance teacher. And um, she completely opened her arms to me and a few other boys who kind of wanted to dance. And um, it was tough, but she, she, she didn't teach us, um, she didn't sort of say, you have to do exams, you have to do X, Y, and Z. She said, come in, experiment and play and learn. I think that's a great way of teaching. I think my most enduring memory is of the dance studio and that wonderful space and that wonderful teacher, Ms. Robinson, I mentioned in the speech, um, and just sort of um, finding out my love of dance. Today, when I teach, her method of teaching is in my mind. In fact, Millfield is still with me. On the um, school website, it calls itself a remarkable place. It is indeed a wonderful school that sends students out into the world well-equipped and ready to face anything. Whatever I do and wherever I go, Millfield will always play a big part. Um, and I think my message for pupils of, who are here today and students you know, you don't have to be the captain of a rugby team, the head of the year, a prefect, to make something. Thank you very much. Uh, Sir John Reith, Chairman of Governors. Governors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, pupils. Uh, it's wonderful to be here again at the Old Millfieldian of the Year Awards. I think uh, we all sit here with equal parts uh, feeling a little inadequate perhaps, but uplifted by what we've heard. And uh, we have another five remarkable people who are being inducted into this amazing Hall of Fame. I suppose as we went along, I was doodling and just picking out a couple of phrases, and I, I really loved the last one. Play, experiment and learn. Uh, experiential education at its best. And uh, taking what one has, fulfilling potential, which was another one that we heard a little earlier on came, saw and conquered as a uh, description of a, a, a young person, an athlete, was uh, something amazing as well. But I have to say that I loved what uh, Guy said, and uh, the Millfield moment is clearly encapsulated in the four, five people that we've had here today. We're very fortunate to have such amazing people who are actually pretty ordinary people when we hear the initial story, but take an education from the school, some inspiration, combine it with what they've got to lead amazing lives. Thank you very much to the family and friends who have been able to come along and support these amazing people. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again at Millfield. Uh, thank you very much for making the effort to come along.